Please join with me in prayer. I loved the church when I was growing up. Almighty God, you bring us to these places where we encounter you. We thank you for the church, for the people in it, for those who love us, for those who care for us. Be with us in this time as we consider your word for us this day. Amen. Growing up, I absolutely loved going to church. There were mornings, of course, where I would have rather stayed home to play, yes. But I loved going to church. You know, like any other squirming kid, I probably was difficult as a child in the sanctuary. And during junior high school, I didn't really want to hang out with other kids my age. So it wasn't all perfect and roses. But actually, it was during that time that I started helping out in Sunday school. And I was a helper and then a teacher even. And I remember one summer I was helping with Vacation Bible School. I was paired up with a retired pastor, and we were both dressed as shepherds all week. During our in-between times, he would often tell me stories, stories about his time as a pastor on an Indian reservation in Arizona. He would share with me about his upbringing. We had this friendship that started when I was in junior high or high school, and it continued for years. Ken was a wise, caring man, and his perspective on my life and on matters of faith, it was inspiring to me. There was another saint who, from a young age, treated me like I was important. She was probably in her 80s when I was in junior high, and then in high school, I joined a committee at church in large part at her encouragement and invitation. She took me under her wing and helped me to understand how to do the work of the committee and why it was important. Ada was also in charge of the liturgists at our church. Before any of us would serve as a reader in church, Ada would have us come to the sanctuary and we would practice the reading. She would stand in various parts of the sanctuary and have you read again and again and again. She taught me from that young age the importance of preparation, especially when it came to the sacred work of leading others in worship. At 14 years old, this woman who had been a widow for more than twice my years of life taught me that I was valued and appreciated. And she connected the dots between what I learned in church and what I needed to know about seeking God. Ada and Ken, both well into their 80s and then their 90s, and along with several other dear ones from my childhood, took the chance of sharing something of their experiences with me. Just a kid. A kid like any other kid who could have simply been ignored or dismissed or marginalized to just looking cute and serving as entertainment. There are dual temptations, you see, for the church. We know that our mainline churches are growing grayer, as they say. The average ages in our congregations are increasing, and people often complain about this. I actually hear it often from friends at other churches and even from folks in our own church. We need more younger people. And sure, it would be great to have more younger people. But one of these temptations is for us to be so focused on who we want to have walk in the door that we forget to see the faithful who are actually walking in the door. This temptation also then leads to see younger families or younger people as a solution to some problem. Ah, new young people will last a little longer now. You see, survival becomes the motivation. So that's one temptation. The second temptation is for us to forget the value of our more senior members. For far too long, churches have valued the participation of members in what I like to call logistical roles. And there was a time when this was necessary, when many people were needed for the logistics of the church. 
Some of these logistical tasks, though, require physical endurance or skill. And for some folks, especially as they advance in years, the ability simply isn't there. And so if our worth is tied up in production, if our worth is tied to the things we can do or produce, or the ways we think we're pulling our weight in the church, then it makes sense that for some, our self-worth and maybe even the worth placed on us by others might be diminished with age. This is not, however, this is not biblical. And it frankly is one of the most dangerous temptations of the church. The church risks the danger of having new generations miss the guideposts that can only be placed through nurtured, safe relationships with the eldest generations. I was shocked to learn several years ago that physical exercise, and in particular strength training, weight training, was not part of health regimens for people over 60 for most of modern history. The more shocking piece of this for me was when I learned that doctors weren't even recommending that seniors incorporate strength training. In fact, it wasn't even really until the 1990s that research became widely accepted that showed that if people over 55 don't begin some sort of strength training, they will begin each day to lose muscle and bone density. And more importantly, though, the positive end of this is that if strength training is done regularly and safely, these exercises build muscle strength and muscle mass. There was a theory that it couldn't be created after a certain age. And they build the muscle mass, preserve bone density, and this results in independence and vitality with age. So it isn't just that you'll lose the muscle and the bone density if you don't grow it, but that if you grow the muscle through strength training, you'll reduce the risks of symptoms of numerous chronic diseases, such as heart disease, arthritis, and type 2 diabetes, while also improving sleep and reducing depression. This is huge news. It was huge news. I, it might be huge news to you today. It's incredibly important for all of us, and particularly those of you in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. And even as I share this, I know there are several of you who have been practicing strength training to combat these upcoming or current challenges. So when looking at the physical body, it seems somewhat obvious that we can age well if we are deliberate. With our spiritual lives, we can also choose to age well. We can incorporate spiritual strength training into our lives. We can choose to explore our faith again and anew. We can do the hard work of examining our faith and sharing it with our grandchildren or our adopted and honorary grandchildren in the church. We can surround ourselves with others who are willing to ask the difficult questions about faith and struggle with the existential yearnings for answers. As we face decisions about our future and our health, we can do so with a willingness to admit our fears and our vulnerabilities. If our faith isn't stretched, if our faith isn't exercised, if our faith isn't constantly being nourished and being examined and being analyzed, we run the risk of having our faith be like our other muscles. Ada used to have me over to her house for breakfast whenever I was home for, for, from college. A few times a year, I would climb on the step stool in her kitchen to retrieve the waffle maker, and over breakfast, she would ask me questions about school, about my faith, and about my future. She would ask, my, ask me questions, but then she would always share a prayer with me, and she would tell me about her own challenges, her own experiences in the past, but also her present challenges. She was always encouraging, but she was also real. That same woman who treated 13-year-old me like a friend worthy of her time treated 20-year-old me like a partner on the journey. 
And I realized that Ada was unique. Unique like Simeon and like Anna in our text today. But I also know that each of us has the ability to be equally as unique. The recipe, like lifting small weights to build muscle mass, is pretty simple. The recipe, the regimen, if you will, means being willing to consider your faith and how you came to faith. Thinking about what the church meant to you growing up and how that might have changed through the years. It means taking the risk of being willing to admit your times of doubt or even your current doubts, but also being willing to acknowledge that even in the midst of those doubts, you've kept coming back. The regimen includes reading scripture and asking the questions, what do these words mean for me? Where am I in this text? Where is God whispering or maybe even shouting at me? And how can I live differently because of this text? A critical ingredient in that recipe is also prayer. Prayer that is silent prayer, prayer that is cried, prayer that is shouted or whispered or written or without words at all. Prayer that brings your whole life and your whole story before the one who knows it all already, the one who created you. But perhaps the most important piece of this regimen, and I say most important not because it's actually more important than those other things, but because all of those things that I've already listed, they're important for all of us, no matter our age, even the youngest among us. In fact, I started 2020 by sharing three goals for us all. I wonder if you remember them, a three-legged stool that I've just already, just now, described again. Three elements, vulnerability with others, with ourselves, and with God. That's one element. I know it sounds like three. That's just one. The second one is reading Scripture, looking for ourselves in the Scripture, listening for God's voice to us in Scripture. And then this third one of prayer. So yes, these three are all part of the recipe for all of us, for our spiritual health. But this one more, this one more important part that Ada and Ken in my early years and Simeon and Anna in our text this morning exhibited was a longing to continue to see God and a longing to see God in the youngest and telling them and telling their parents and telling the world that they see possibilities and they see their own faith ready to be played out and lived out in the lives of others and in the world around them. The courage to praise God in their presence, not merely as an act of religious piety, but as a daring and bold act of prophetic faith. Now more than ever is the time for each of us, particularly as we embark on a new year and walk toward the horizon of the pandemic ever slowly, now is the time for us to begin to ask the question of how we'll see and proclaim God in the world and how we'll see and proclaim God to others and what risks we'll be willing to take to examine our faith, examine our beliefs, and to tell the stories, not just stories of our experiences or our memories. Those are great. We all love them. But the story of our faith, the stories of where God has been present. Simeon prays to God. He he shouts out to God, my eyes have seen your salvation. He says this to God upon meeting Jesus, but he also says it out loud, and he says it to those new parents, those new parents who we can only imagine just 30 days, 40 days after the birth of Jesus, poor parents traveling by foot many, many miles. They're tired, they're weary, and here this man says to them, these words of encouragement. And then the prophet Anna, she's there too, and and she is advanced in years, and she praises God for God's faithfulness when she meets the baby Jesus. And she speaks to others about what God has done. 
And she speaks about who Jesus is going to be. She even tells Mary these painful words that that this child is going to be derided by so many. She tells the whole story of his life in that moment. She boldly, she boldly shares her faith in that moment. Certainly, prophetic words are not limited to folks who are in their advanced years. But the oldest among us are in the unique position where if they exercise those same faith muscles, they don't let them sit by the wayside, part of a past or maybe even not ever part of their faith experience. If they exercise those same three faith muscles, their soul will respond. And all of us must be ready to listen, ready to hear, ready to draw encouragement. In 2021, I am confident that we'll have new opportunities to learn from one another, grow with one another, and seek support from one another as we journey with one another closer to God, deliberately, faithfully, fearfully, expectantly, and all the while, loving one another, and experiencing God through one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.